Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife felt insecure in the relationship and committed. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. I've always had a soft spot for redheads, and this redheaded woman in particular. In fact, it may have been this woman standing in front of me, asking me to dance, that started my fascination with redheads. Each of us, every man I know, has a dream girl, a perfect combination of night appeal, beauty, and character that God put on this earth just for us. Just as every man is different from another, the realization of our dreams varies. Some prefer dark-haired women with mysterious looks and curves that ooze intimate appeal, others like slender, blue-eyed blondes who are so chilled that with every word they say, it feels like a little light bulb goes on inside. There are those who prefer exotic women of African or Asian descent, and those who claim that only Latinas are suitable for them. But for me, it was always redheads. Ever since this woman came into my life when I started high school, Marion Jones has been the queen of all my fantasies. I still remember that day when we all sat in the classroom and waited for the teacher to start roll call. As soon as the teacher reached her name on the list, she entered the room. I'm here, she said. Her voice was so musical that you could dance to it. And come to think of it, that voice hasn't changed since then. She was already a woman among girls, don't think she was one of those girls who develop early and already have huge breasts in high school. Marion has never had, and probably never will have, large breasts. In fact, I don't think she's ever had average-sized breasts. But what she has is perfect, just like everything else about her. Imagine milky white skin that never tans. She has a scattering of freckles on her perfect nose and cheeks. Her mouth is so perfectly formed that I could just stare at it for weeks. Her green eyes almost glow, they're so bright. When she smiles, the whole room lights up. However, all this pales in comparison to her main decoration. The first thing people notice about Marion is her fire engine red hair. Her hair reaches moves with the slightest turn of her head. She was skinny back then in high school, just as she is now. The years since then have given her a more mature shape, but she will never become curvy or even round. It does not matter, her attractiveness goes beyond mere measurements, and almost any man would choose her over all other women. On that first day of high school, we were both freshmen in the same class. It was a difficult start, and I would like to say that our sheer excitement brought us closer together and created a bond that survived everything that tried to tear us apart. Well, I wish I could say that, but I can't. From day one, our lives took different paths. She immediately took over the school and breezed through her school years. She loved and enjoyed school. Although she was only a freshman, she became, much to the chagrin of the senior girls, the queen of the school. They even changed some of the rules for her. She became a cheerleader without even qualifying. Among all the blondes and brunettes at school, she stood out. Several girls who thought that her defining feature was her hair dyed their hair and were ridiculed. She was elected queen or princess at every possible event and was also on the honor roll. Everyone nominated her for every possible position, if there was a committee, club, or society, she was on it. As for our romance, it was strictly one-sided. I loved her like flowers love the sun, and I think she noticed me once when we were both photographed for the honors list. I'm sure that even though we were in the same class for four years and I sat next to her in math for two years in a row, she didn't know my name. Okay, I'm wrong, I'm sure she knew my name. I was a complete nerd in high school. For those of you who don't know what that means, nerds are kids who are too cool to hang out with, even for a nerd. Nerds aren't smart enough to be cool, aren't coordinated enough to be athletes, and are too socially awkward to be anything in between. My proudest moment in high school was when I was elected vice president of the juggling club. That year, the juggling club had three members, a president, a vice president, and a member. In fact, I was a member until the former vice president left. That's how I became vice president. In my senior year, I thought I would become president, but that year, the director decided that the juggling club should be closed. In any case, my dream princess heard about me regularly. I was the guy who was always the butt of her jock boyfriend's jokes. Morris Green was the male version of Marion at our school. They were at the top of the school hierarchy, although they were complete opposites. Marion was quiet, kind, and beautiful. 
She was polite to everyone and never said a single rude word. For such a beautiful girl, it was amazing. Morris, who liked to be called M.O., was huge, imposing, arrogant, rude, and a real jerk. Those were his good qualities, if you can believe it. He had four years to bully the nerds at our school, and he loved every minute of it. What M.O. can be credited with is that he bullied everyone he considered beneath him, which of course included everyone he met. He was the type of guy who would simply walk off the field after a game of football or basketball without bothering to shake hands with his opponents. Well, of course we won, was his usual comment. Marion was so polite that before and after each game, she would go and introduce herself to the cheerleaders on the other side, coordinating when they would cheer or perform their routines so that both groups could actually perform together. Most people, even athletes from other teams, liked her, but most of her opponents hated M.O. Well, that's not entirely true. In fact, most of the guys on our team hated M.O. too. M.O. was a guard on our football team, a center on our basketball team, and he also ran track and field for the last two years. Some people said that M.O. was a three-time champion, but that was just his knowledge of the alphabet. Perhaps Mo's greatest achievement was when he asked me to show him some juggling techniques. He had a few guys around and claimed they went to the circus and saw the jugglers. Sensing an opportunity to make friends with the popular crowd, I quickly pulled out my juggling balls and began to juggle. They yawned as soon as I started. Can you juggle clubs? asked Demo. Well, I've never tried, I said. I guess I need to start with two to get a feel for the rhythm and balance them out. Great, Emo said. Some of these guys don't think you can juggle two clubs. Show them what you've got. He pulled out from behind his back two clubs that looked like bowling pins and thrust them into my hands. I tried tossing them slightly in front of me, just like I did with the balls. For some reason, the clubs wouldn't leave my hands, and I started hitting myself in the face with them while M.O. and his friends laughed. Finally, I realized that M.O. had coated the clubs with some very powerful superglue. It was even worse the next day when I came to school with two black eyes and irritated skin on my arms. M.O. met me in the hallway and told everyone that I had burned my hands while pleasuring myself, without lotion, of course. High school was not my favorite time of life, but it passed, as everything does. College was better, but not much, and finally, I entered real life. I studied computer science in college and was successful. I graduated early, got a job at a big company, and started making good money. Without going into too much detail, I met, or rather, re-met, a girl I went to high school with, and we started dating. Now, 12 years after leaving school, Marion Jones, the woman of my dreams, wants to dance with me. To tell you the truth, I would love to dance with her, but I still have questions. I can tell you're wondering what I'm talking about. To fully understand this situation, we need to go back two years. Our school attaches great importance to alumni meetings. Every year, there is a general meeting of all high school classes. Meetings are also held after 5, 10, 15, etc. years for specific classes. Two years ago, we had our 10th anniversary reunion, that's when it all started. Heck, to fully understand this, you have to go back a little further to the meeting. As you already know from the information provided, I was not one of those who peaked in high school. In fact, I would say that high school was a time in my life that I would rather forget. After college, as mentioned, I got a job at a large software company. I was great at writing code and helping customers learn our products. The problem was that sometimes, when big companies release products, they have a that's what it is attitude. You know how Microsoft releases the next version of Excel? They add whatever they think will make it better but usually ignore what users actually need. Our company did the same. In my free time, I wrote code for fun and experimented with business software, so you can probably guess what happened next. I had a meeting with a client, a woman who owned a small boutique. As an older woman, she didn't have much knowledge of how to use our spreadsheet program. I spent several days trying to help her, but it didn't help. My boss told me that we couldn't afford to spend so much personal time on one client and that I should move on to the next one. He said it was time to let her figure it out on her own. But I was not that kind of person, so I agreed to continue training the woman to use our software, only I had to do it outside of work hours. That's how I ended up at Florence Joyner's house. 
Mrs. Joyner's boutique closed at 6 p.m., and I finished work at 5 p.m. This gave me the opportunity to go home and get myself in order. Mrs. Joyner was a widow at 58 years old. She was still beautiful and exercised regularly. Her body could put many young women to shame. I spent a lot of time trying to teach her how to use our office suite, but she ended up teaching me a lot more. It all started innocently. Mrs. Joyner often changed into more comfortable clothes after work. She wore shorts that showed off her still incredible, almost 60-year-old legs, and loose tops. I tried to be polite and not stare, but I couldn't help myself. She seemed to notice that I was trying not to look, and this excited her. Stephen, what are you thinking about right now? She asked. About teaching you how to use macros, I replied. Tell the truth, she said. You were thinking about my breasts, weren't you? Perhaps, I said. Flo took on the role of teacher that evening, and over the next six weeks, the lessons doubled. We met two to three times a week for computer and intimate lessons. It was at this time that I decided it would be easier to develop a software package specifically for Florence, and so I did. She was delighted and told many of her friends who owned businesses about it. Soon, I had a lot of clients and started making decent money on the side. Florence also convinced me to start running and playing sports. I slowly started adding muscle to my lean body. I may never be a giant muscle bruiser, but I have gotten in better shape. If life had a plan for me, this was just the beginning. Without even realizing it, I was on the path to success. Florence had a son who was a top manager in a large trading company. For many years during tax time, he sent one of the accountants who worked for him to do his mother's bookkeeping. During the year that Florence used my software, there was very little to do. When Al Joyner, Florence's son, found out about this, he wanted to know what happened, and that's how we met. This led to me getting my first corporate contract and quitting my day job. After a few months, I hired three more programmers to cope with the number of clients. Small business was also more than I could handle. It was becoming difficult to manage everything, and I started looking for a secretary to help with organizing things. The woman who had the most impact on me out of everyone I interviewed was a woman named Dana Plato. I was sure I had heard this name somewhere before. Even as she sat across from me, something about her seemed familiar. After reviewing her resume and realizing she did not have the required experience or education, I returned her resume and told her we would contact her. I was sure we both knew it wouldn't happen. In some ways, I'm glad I didn't get the job, she said. How do you know you didn't get it? I asked. We haven't made a decision yet. Stephen, you've always been polite, she said. I had a difficult few months after college. My only experience is in fast food. In college, I took a general education program because I didn't know what I wanted to do. When the money ran out and I had to go to work, I was far from finishing my degree. We both know I don't have the knowledge for what you do or the secretarial skills to handle the job, but it's nice to see someone I know become successful. This is very encouraging. So maybe I'll go back to school and actually achieve something. In a couple of years, maybe you'll have another interview, and this time I'll be ready for it. Do we know each other? I asked, looking at her again. She was very sweet but almost invisible. Her eyes were dull brown, her hair was mouse-colored. The only thing I could say about her facial features was that they were normal. She was neither thin nor fat, her body was average. She was the type of woman you see everywhere, she could blend into the landscape and go unnoticed because nothing about her stood out. Stephen Grant, she said irritably. Not you too. She put her hand on her hip and stood up as if she were about to leave. For most of high school, we had pretty much the same schedule. We even did a group science project together. I came to your parents' house, your mom made us cookies. You drank Pepsi because you told me we were too old. Oh, I whispered. Sorry, Dana. This is Dana, she said. And don't worry, no one will ever remember me. In high school, I was just a face in the crowd. Why should you be different? I asked. I would have given anything to be you in high school. At least being anonymous kept you safe. Try being the butt of one of the most popular guys in school. You should say something to the director, she said, smiling. 
I could tell she was trying to hold back her laughter. So you remember some of them, don't you? I asked. She nodded and had to look away. That one time you went out for the track team, and they tied your shoes to the starting blocks was priceless, she laughed. She couldn't hold it in any longer and just burst out laughing. You came out of the blocks like a rocket. It was so great, it was like you risked everything you had for one shot to achieve something good. You gave it your all, and everyone in that crowd felt it, but your legs couldn't really move, so your lunge just sprained you, and you landed face down on the asphalt path, groaning in frustration. Everyone at school laughed at you. Yes, Dana, I said, it was really funny. I dislocated my jaw and needed seven stitches to close the wound on my chin. If you look closely, you can still see the scar. As usual, Alamo got a pat on the back. They suspended him for two practices, but he didn't even miss a game. He just had to sit on the bench with all his friends, watch the team practice, and complain about what a bad athlete I was. For the next few weeks, everyone at school was talking about what a loser I was because it was just a joke. Thanks for the memories, I said. Suddenly, she saw that I was serious and perhaps understood the event from my point of view. Her jaw dropped and she ran her hand over her mouth. The look of sadness on her face let me know that she truly had no idea about the level of pain I was going through. I'm so sorry, Stephen, she said. I just never imagined, why didn't you talk to the director? Yes, Dana, I said, but he always pretended it was just typical school pranks. Besides, how could he seriously punish the school's golden boy because of some nameless weirdo? Maybe being invisible isn't such a bad thing, she said. Can I make amends? I'll buy you lunch. I accepted her invitation, if only to show her that I had no hard feelings. That lunch turned into dinner, which turned into a series of dates that led to our wedding. There were a few bumps in our relationship, but nothing serious. Dana was born into a dysfunctional family. Her father was a salesman who cheated on her mother to the point that she eventually kicked him out and raised the children alone. Dana never wanted to be in that position, and we argued about me touring when we finally got engaged. My accountant insisted on a prenuptial agreement to limit the damage my finances would suffer in the event of a divorce. Dana had no problems with this. She understood that I had built my business before we started working together and still did not foresee that we would ever get divorced. We were like two peas in a pod and truly loved each other. The only thing I insisted on was a zero-tolerance clause in cases of cheating. If one of us cheated on the other, that person lost all rights to everything we had accumulated outside of my business. It was scary because if I ever slipped, I would keep my business, but I would lose my house and everything else I owned. But Dana was worth it, and I knew I would never cheat on her. Dana, besides being my wife, was my first real relationship. Flo and I had FWB intim relationships, but there was no love on either side. To make things even clearer, Dana was not a virgin on her wedding night, but I had to teach her everything. The only night she had was with college guys who just wanted quick, drunken encounters. The first time she did this was when she was 20, and only because all her friends were constantly talking about it. I may not have been her first, but I was the first to make her enjoy it and understand what her friends were talking about. For a while, we did this all the time and experimented with everything we heard about. Having money changed our lives, but not as much as we might have expected. We lived within our means and planned to have children. We received several things. I, for one, drove a brand new Mustang Boss 302 and a Lacuna that was barely street legal. Otherwise, I was the same old man I always was. Dana, on the other hand, drove a big luxury Lexus SUV because that's what all the wives in our gated community did. She also had some work to do while I worked on my car to make it even faster. Dana worked on herself. She received breast implants. The first time was just to make her look more normal and her clothes fit her better. She also dyed her hair blonde and had a nose job. She received collagen injections to make her lips fuller and also got butt implants. She claimed that she did all this for me, saying that an important man like me should have a wife that everyone pays attention to. I continued the runs and workouts I started with Flo and saw results, too. Dana made me go to another hairdresser. He changed my hairstyle to make me look less weird. I also got contacts because Dana hated my glasses. So, at 28 years old, we had it all. The business grew by leaps and bounds, 
and I received offers to buy out my share from several large companies, including my former employer. We had a plan for our life. Our intention was for me to give up work for the next two years and travel. We wanted to see the world and go crazy for a couple of years and then settle down at age 30 and start a family. It made sense to us. I still remember the day the train derailed. I actually remember the second one. I just brought the mail and threw it on the table. Two envelopes contained invitations for Dana and me to our 10-year reunion. I immediately threw mine in the trash. I was surprised when Dana looked at me like I was crazy and pulled it out, wiping the dirt off of it. What are you doing, Stevie? She asked. Dana, I hated high school, I replied. I see no reason to go back and relive the worst period of my life. I don't want to see this place or these people ever again. You have stones in your head, Stevie, she said. Our life is perfect. We are no longer alone like we were in high school. We have each other. This is our chance to show all those people who looked down on us or ignored us that we are just as good as they are. Can we go, please? I grumbled a little but eventually relented. I couldn't refuse Dana anything, and she saw this as a chance to show everyone what kind of woman she had become. While I saw only a night filled with uncomfortable experiences, I was now an adult and wasn't going to put up with the crap I had to endure back then. I didn't expect pleasure, but Dana wanted it so badly. What could I say? Everything is done differently in the world. Over the next few days, I learned that homecoming isn't just one night, it's a whole weekend. It all started on Friday with the so-called dating evening. It was an opportunity to meet old school friends and see who they had become. There was a beach picnic on Saturday, followed by a dance that night, and finally, on Sunday morning, a farewell breakfast. Should we just go to the dance and skip the rest? I suggested. No, dear. You can't do that, Dana said. Don't you want to show me off? Dana was acting very strangely. It seemed she was really looking forward to this reunion. I just wanted it to end quickly, but I loved her, so I gave in again. As the event approached, Dana began to get anxious. She acted as if it was her debut ball. Can't we fly there and rent a limousine? She asked. We need to show our best side. We must show people that they can no longer humiliate us. We are important people. Dana, it's only two hours away, and there's no airport in town. We would still have to drive from the nearest airport to the city, which will take more than an hour. In this case, it is faster to get there by car. Besides, if things go badly, we can leave whenever we want. Oh, there will be no leaving, mister, she said. No one will drive me away from here. Finally, the weekend of the reunion arrived and we were arguing about which car to drive. I wanted to take my boss 302 or the new Shelby 1000. Dana wanted to drive her Lexus. We went with the boss. On the way there, Dana gave me instructions on what to say and, more importantly, what not to say. I immediately forgot everything. In fact, I had no intention of talking to anyone other than Dana. I was going to stay in the shadows and be as inconspicuous as possible, hoping no one would remember me. I thought I had a good chance of making it because I didn't look like a nerd anymore. With a little luck, I was confident I could pull it off. As we entered the city, all eyes were on us. Even before we reached the hotel or meeting point, my Mustang, with its two-toned black and red paint job and menacing roar, attracted a lot of attention. As Dana looked around behind her huge fashionable sunglasses, she began to smile. Honey, maybe I like this car after all, she said, hugging me. Everyone who saw her stopped and looked at us. We checked into our room and left our luggage while Dana laid out her clothes in the closet. I just stretched out on the bed and watched her. Stevie, your clothes will get wrinkled if you lie in them, she warned. We have to make a good first impression. We don't want our classmates to think we're slobs. Yeah, them, I muttered. After half an hour of me relaxing and Dana primping, we headed out to dating night. I patted the bed hard. Get some rest, buddy, you'll need this, I said. Stevie, why are you talking to the bed? Dana asked curiously. Because when this show is over tonight, my dear, I said lovingly, pulling her towards me. Luckily, the hotel and conference center where the reunion was held was only a mile away. If Dana hadn't been with me, I probably would have just walked 
but even I had to admit that the looks we got as I parked my barely legal, barely drivable muscle car in the parking lot were worth enduring and hiding from a few idiots I barely remembered. Usually, when I got out of the car, I left my sunglasses inside. It's kind of rude to hide behind them when talking to people. But in this case, I thought it would be a good idea to use them to at least partially conceal my features. For me, this evening was not about bonding or memories, it was about survival. We entered a large conference room and stood in line at a sign that said, Register here. Well, I went, Dana could barely move in the high heels she was wearing. She had on a light blue dress that was clearly custom made. The top was widened to accommodate her breasts, the waist was reduced, and it even tapered to fit her buttocks. In theory, no woman with such large breasts and buttocks should have such a narrow waist. Her dazzling, almost white hair stood out against the background of her light blue dress. It seemed like she had been sewn into this dress, although it was tight, it still completely covered her from neck to mid-calf. It had to be cute but not vulgar. I'm not sure it achieved that. The shoes she wore were the same shade of blue as the dress and were specially made to match. When I joked about it, Dana got very defensive and reminded me that she didn't say anything when I painted the brake calipers the same shade of red as the stripes on my car and painted the rotor caps glossy black. I quickly shut up about it. In any case, the shoes had such high heels that most dancers wouldn't wear them. Dana held my hand tightly as we walked to the registration area with her baby steps. People walked around us and passed us at an alarming rate, also staring at Dana. Most men noticed her breasts and buttocks, I heard more than a few whistles. Most women noticed that Dana was orange, apparently, she spent too much time in the tanning salon, but I loved her, so I didn't say anything, especially since it was her evening. While standing in line and waiting to receive our badges, several people around us tried to strike up conversations. I attempted to let them know I wasn't interested in talking, but I tried not to be rude. The guy in line right behind me didn't want to fall behind. He continued to make comments from time to time until I realized he had no idea who I was. He also spent most of his time talking to me while staring at Dana's buttocks and breasts. He was shorter than me but stocky, his short, cropped hair and glasses made him look much older. His features were very familiar to me, and suddenly I recognized him. Marty? I said. Marty McFly? Um, yeah, he said, looking at me. You're not going to slap me upside the head or anything like that, are you? We're too old for this. I thought it was strange that Marty thought I was one of the people who did the slapping in school. Marty, pull yourself together, I said. I never smacked you before, so why should I start now? He looked at me, still trying to figure out who he was talking to. In a way, my anonymity was intoxicating, I liked knowing who Marty was while he had no idea who he was talking to. So what are you doing now? I asked. He looked at me as if dying to ask who I was, but out of politeness, he answered my question. Actually, I'm looking for a new job, he said. I work now, but I don't really like where I am. And what are you doing? I asked. I'm an accountant, he said. Shut up. I exclaimed cheerfully. Dana, Marty became an accountant. Dana turned, looked down at him, and squeezed my hand even tighter. Wow, this is wonderful, honey, she said, before continuing to skin the crowd to see who was looking at her. That's everyone's reaction, he said. Being an accountant is just not fun. Unless you need an accountant, I said. And I need him. How do you feel about moving? He looked at me strangely. Um, that would be okay, I guess, he said hesitantly, still not sure if I was serious. Before we could continue our conversation, we all fell silent along with the rest of the guys in line, watching what was happening. A woman standing about four places ahead of us took off the scarf covering her head, and it was as if the sun had suddenly appeared. She shook her head, and three or four feet of curly red hair came free. A gasp rang through the crowd, and the jaws of all but two men in the room dropped. One of these jaws was mine, the other belonged to a big guy moving toward us, followed by two other guys. It was funny, at least to me, M.O. hadn't aged well. He was still huge, but where there had been muscle mass, there was now a lot of fat. He still had the same arrogant look, but now he didn't give me the same impression. I didn't feel the slightest fear or awe, in fact, looking at him, I was ready to leave. 
I wasn't impressed by his clothes, Emil was in a suit, but not a good one. In fact, he was the only guy in the room wearing a suit. It was too hot for a suit, especially for just dating night, there was no one to impress here. Most of the guys chose to keep their costumes for dancing. His hairline also began to recede, it seemed that Mo's hair was afraid of his face and was trying to get as far away from him as possible. He still had that same smug grin on his face as he walked to the front of the line. The two guys who were one step behind him and a little to the side were even funnier. I recognized them instantly, Todd Bridges, who used to guard M.O. at left guard, and Gary Coleman, our former star running back. I heard that Gary didn't have a career in professional sports, he hurt his back or something. Maybe this explains his limping gait. The three of them walked to the front of the line, and M.O. started talking as loudly as ever. Why do you need to stand in line? he asked. Just take our things and let's go. There are people here who came before us. Dear, she said. It was strange, the musical tone of her voice still affected me. The difference was that he had become mature, instead of sounding playful and perky, it now sounded mature and compassionate. The way she spoke to him was not like a girl who could give him something he wanted, but rather like a mother trying to gently teach a child that he was behaving badly. Why don't you go out and find that car you wanted to see? When I register with you, I will come for you, she said. He nodded and turned around, looking at everyone around him. Then, in a very good imitation of Eric Von Zipper, he snapped his fingers and pointed toward the door. He and his friends then walked out into the parking lot. I could hardly contain my laughter. God, he's still a, someone said. Why does she stay with him? I tried to catch Marion's eye like I did at school, but before I could do this, the hand holding mine squeezed even tighter. Zot tolerance means you leave with nothing, she said. That witch and her boyfriend dominated everyone at school. Those days are over, Dana said. You're married and happy, remember? I just smiled at her. Beside us, Marty nodded vigorously. She's absolutely right, he said. I don't care about them. Let's talk about the fact that you need an accountant. Dana looked at Marty as if she had noticed him for the first time and smiled. Marty caught her smile and winked at me. Where did you meet your beautiful wife? He asked. Oh my God, Marty, I exclaimed. She studied with us. She was Dana Plato. Who was it? He asked. He looked at her, then again took out his school album and found her photo. Wow, he said. The years have been kind to you, darling. If I knew that you would become like this. Their conversation was interrupted by voices from the front of the line. Mrs. Garrett, one of our old teachers working at the registration desk, ran into a problem. Is this Mrs. Garrett? asked someone in line. She must have run out of alcohol and can't function. She was already an alcoholic ten years ago, someone else said. It's nice to see that nothing has changed. I hated that, someone else added. All this crap about the facts of life is getting to me. Funny thing is, there was never a Mr. Garrett. At that moment, I saw a cloud of red hair moving toward the front of the line. She walked over and started talking to the women at the registration desk and simply took on the role of Mrs. Garrett. Within a few moments, the line moved faster than before. Marin seemed to remember most of the people in line and simply asked them to sign a list and then selected their name tags. Everyone wondered why Mrs. Garrett took so long to complete this job. As we approached the table, she smiled at us, and my legs gave way. Dana immediately stared at her with hatred, but Marin did not respond in kind, which angered Dana even more. If teenage Marion was beautiful, nearly 30-year-old Marion was stunning. I could barely look at her, it was like looking at the sun. Sorry, she smiled. I don't recognize you. How many of you studied at our school? Both, Dana said sharply. I'm Dana P.L., and this is Stephen Grant. Stevie! Marty exclaimed behind me. Little Stevie from the Juggling Club. Damn it! I do not recognize you, Marin said, looking at me and smiling again. You always had such strength of character. Sometimes I wonder how you stand it. My heart broke when they did all those terrible things to you. I would like to stick your skinny fifth place up, Dana blurted out. Just give us our badges and let us go. 
Damn, what do you think this is? A homecoming. Sorry, Marin said. I just... Ten years later. Damn it, Dana said, grabbing our name tags and walking away from the table. As we entered the large room where everyone was supposed to socialize, Marty caught up with us. Dana, don't you think you were... I began. She turned around sharply and looked at me. What? She blurted out. Rude, I suggested. This is acting the same as she did then. Dana, I said, she didn't know you then. You haven't communicated, she had no contact with you, and you don't look the same as you did then. Her not recognizing you was kind of a compliment. Steve, not you either, she said. Every guy in school was always rooting for that. You act like her, it doesn't smell. I can't believe my own husband is standing by her side. Dana, I'm not on her side. I'm always on your side, for better or worse. You're the one I care about, and that's why I felt the need to tell you that you're acting like a... I know we were treated poorly at school. Many people do the same. Most of us have outgrown this, so we do not need to behave the same way as them. They were children then, we are adults now. Just enjoy the memories of how it was and how it ended. If you really want revenge, find someone you hated and compare your life to theirs. You did pretty well, I'm very happy with our life. She kissed me and nodded very pleased. Dear, she said, so leave all this old crap. It's not worth worrying about now. Go and socialize unless you want to discuss accounting styles with me and Marty. After she left, Marty and I started talking about business. It turned out that Marty was a certified public accountant and could easily handle my need for a full-time accountant. Of course, he would actually serve as the CFO. I hope to eventually be able to let him make many of his financial decisions on his own. While we were talking, we noticed that several other people had joined our conversation. They got closer, and finally, a woman I didn't remember came up and introduced herself. She was a stocky woman with a pretty face. What made her cuter was her rosy-cheeked smile. I'm Natalie Green, she said. I was in your class, like everyone else here, and I listened to you talk about work. What company do you work for, and do you have any other vacancies? What about marketing? Asked the man standing a few feet away from Natalie. Do you have any vacancies in the sales department? Asked a musical voice from the crowd. The assembled people parted like the Red Sea, and Marin stepped toward us. Guys, this is not a job fair, this is a reunion, I said. We have the whole weekend, and I will try to collect information about my company and make it available to anyone who is interested. I will arrange it so that after the meeting is over, everyone can come and see what we are doing and how you might fit in. But for now, let's get back to finding out how each other's lives turn out. As soon as I said that, a couple of our old teachers walked up to the microphone at the back of the room and started talking about the events for the next two days. We should have used this evening to catch up with friends, food and drinks were provided in a nearby room. The next day would be a big one, Saturday morning breakfast followed by a beach picnic, the dance on Saturday evening, and the farewell breakfast early Sunday morning. We were still looking for people to participate in sporting events. This year, they decided to do something unusual. Instead of all the traditional picnic games like sack races or three-legged races, they wanted to take it a step further. There were three events, and I instantly knew who was helping to plan them. There was a basketball game, a football game, and a race around the school track. Surprisingly, there was no baseball, tennis, or anything like that. Was it a coincidence that the three sports chosen were the ones in which M.O. received his credit? The idea was to get a group of kids together to play soccer against the school team of the time, another group to play against the basketball team, and anyone could take part in the mile. I decided to skip all three. M.O. and his friends seemed thrilled to be able to dominate a group of nearly 30-year-old athletes sitting on the couch. They wanted nothing more than to relive their glory days. I wonder whose idea it was, asked several people in the crowd. Everyone returned to talking with those around them. Marty and I spoke with a couple of the most interested people from our previous discussion. I noticed Marin talking to M.O. as I looked around for Dana. She was on the other side of the room completely surrounded by guys. I started to make my way toward her, but my path was blocked by M.O. and his friends. So, you are Steve, huh, he said. I think I should apologize for the way I treated you back in the old days. 
He extended his hand, and I looked at it. This is not a trick, he said. Listen, Morris, I began. My friends call me Mo. he smiled. Listen, the past is the past, there is no way to return to it. I'm not who I was then. I started again, I said. My thoughts are exactly the same, he said. You have a cool car and your wife, oh my god, she didn't look like that in school. If I knew she would become like this, I would have chased her myself. He smiled widely, and his friends nodded. Anyway, the old chain, mine not yours, says that you now own your company and perhaps are looking for employees. As he continued to talk, I noticed that Marin had come closer and that Dana was heading toward me with even greater speed. They reached us almost simultaneously. Marin smiled at me as she walked up to him, oh, and Dana grabbed my hand and pulled me toward her. Darlings, tell everyone that we will see them in the morning. We still need to check into our hotel, she said loudly. I waved to the people standing around us and let Dana pull me out of earshot. As soon as we were away, Dana lunged at me. That means I've already caught you making cow eyes at that witch, she snapped. You remember our zero tolerance agreement, don't you? You're standing there like an island in a sea of guys looking at you. It doesn't matter, you can do whatever you want, but am I locked up? What are you talking about, she asked. I can't help it if men want to look at me, but you need to stay away from that witch. Dana, not once in the two times that I spoke with Marin did I initiate the conversation or seek her out. She's happily married to that piece of cement you pulled me away from, I said. I was watching her the whole time we were there, Dana snapped. She never took her eyes off you. She's the one who pointed it out to you, M.O., dumbass, and I won't stand for it. This thinks everyone should bow to her every guy she sees, and she can't have mine. Can you believe that? Some idiot has already named her Reunion Queen. Who cares? I asked. Dana, you need to stop letting all this childish crap get to you. Do you want to just go home now? I told you from the very beginning that we went so we could leave at any time. Maybe we should just go now. Okay, I'll calm down, she said. Besides, someone shouldn't have, and I quote, kicked my fifth place. Did you mean that literally or figuratively? Both, I grinned. Well, let's get down to business, she said, taking my hand again. Once we got back to the car, I lit the tires as I headed out of the parking lot. It's good that our hotel was nearby. The next morning, I woke up first and started running my fingers along her side. Her hand squeezed mine like a vice. No way, she said. No way, Jose. I thought you were mine and I could have you whenever I wanted, I said. Don't you always say that I'm yours and you can have me whenever you want? She grinned. I would give myself to you gladly, but you have something important today, and you'll need all your energy, so save it until the evening. After the dance, maybe we can do something quick and dirty during the dance if I can't wait. What am I doing that is more important than this? I asked. That's enough, Stephen, she snapped. I want you to participate in that stupid sporting event. Oh hell no! I snapped back. Why would I put myself in a position where I would be humiliated by these Neanderthals when I could stay here and have you all day? All day, she asked dreamily. I simply nodded. Over and over again. She bit her lip as if she were having a hard time deciding. No, we need it, she said. I worked hard yesterday, but you've barely begun to scratch the surface. I will win by today, but I don't want to be there without you. Okay, Dana, spit it out. I said. I want you to run for king of the meeting, she said. I'm sure if you try, you can beat him, oh. There are a lot of people here who hate his damn guts. I'm pretty sure that based on all those guys you complained about last night, I can beat your dream girl. My body is much better than hers. I wasn't so sure about that last statement. Of course, Dana had much larger breasts, but they were artificial. Her fifth place was also fake, and her face couldn't compare to Marion's. Marion's milky skin and freckles were much more attractive, at least to me, than Dana's too dark bottle tan. I have two words for you, I said. Hell no. An hour later, I stood on the beach in front of the buffet, with Dana's alternating frown and displeasure expression.
I was wearing baggy shorts and an oversized t-shirt, while Dana had a cape that extended to her knees. We looked out onto the beach at the tables that were set up and saw Amo and his friends chatting loudly as they stuffed their mouths with huge amounts of food. At the opposite end of their table, Marion sat alone. She looked up and waved to us. I waved back, and Dana knocked my hand away. I can't believe you, she snapped. You can wave to this, but you can't do one little thing for me? Waving to Marion does not cause me any embarrassment or possible pain, I said. Several people came to our table. Marty was playing basketball, so he was warming up next to us. Three or four guys came up to talk to Dana and were introduced to me. They were all looking me up and down, trying to size me up for some reason. At nine o'clock, everyone headed to the basketball court and took their seats in the stands. We presented our school basketball team, or what was left of it. There were only three original players in the starting five. The other two guys were from the junior school team and a football player. The other team was even worse. Believe it or not, Marty, my balding, burly, uncoordinated future accountant, was their prankster. You could have been there, Dana snapped. With all the training and running you do, you'd probably be the best of them all. She crossed her arms over her chest and stared at me. One of the coaches came up to us and said a few words to Dana. We have to go, honey, she said and left me sitting in the stands. The game had begun, and the action was neither fast nor furious. It was terrible. It was an almost even battle between a team of former athletes and a group of determined guys who had never played. The game was scheduled to last 30 minutes, divided into four quarters of seven minutes each. During the first quarter, we were all on the edge of our seats watching both teams run, then jog, and finally walk down the court without making a single shot. Finally, just before the whistle, someone fouled one of the guys on the team. He was awarded two free throws. He missed the first throw with embarrassment and then hit the second. Even that shot was funny because the ball bounced off the backboard and onto the rim. He circled the rim so many times that I felt dizzy before it finally fell into the basket from exhaustion. Then the game got interesting. The cheerleaders ran onto the court to support the team. Most cheerleaders are past their prime, they didn't encourage as much as they just shouted. Their lack of enthusiasm was contagious, and I was ready to go back to the buffet until Marion lined up just before the cheerleaders finished. She was wearing shorts, and you could see she was wearing a skimpy swimsuit underneath. But when she jumped into the air and shook her pom-poms, the game got interesting. I wanted the team to score thousands of points just to see her cheering. The team scored again early in the second quarter. This time, it was an easy shot, and it was deserved. The Never Never team was too tired to move around the court, so the shot was unimpeded. The first half ended with the score 3-0 in favor of M.O. and his boys, who cruised to victory, as we all expected. However, I don't think any of us expected it to be so boring. All the guys on both teams looked like they'd run a marathon, and I didn't look that bad when I actually ran one. It seemed funny to me. The chuckle stopped when, early in the second half, one of the never-be-seen guys scored a lucky goal. He simply threw the ball toward the basket, not expecting to hit it, and was surprised when his name was announced. He gestured, who, me? What made the game no longer funny was when the cheerleaders of the Never Never team took to the court. There were three overweight women and my wife, Dana. She removed her cape, revealing a strappy leotard that most dancers wouldn't wear outside of a bar. Dana did not dare to jump, she only shook her pom-poms slightly, and even this plunged the crowd into absolute silence. Every man there, except me, was praying that the swimsuit would fail, and every woman there, except Dana, thought she was an insert negative descriptor here. After that, the entire crowd cheered for the Never Never team just to look at Dana. The game finally ended with a score of 4-2 after one of the guys on the team made another free throw. After finishing the game, I headed back to the buffet. I thought about just going back to the hotel. I was more embarrassed than I had been in high school because of Dana and her swimsuit. Darling, there you are, Dana said, approaching me. Don't eat this. You don't want to get overwhelmed. Dana, get the hell out, I said. What happened to you, she asked. Dana, from the moment you received the invitation, you knew that I didn't want to be here. It's a waste of time. You can't go back, you can't make up for the way you were treated at school. Besides, you weren't treated badly. 
Maybe you didn't get any attention, but no one shoved fireworks down your pants or doused you with a super soaker full of dog piss, I said. But since we came here, you've behaved worse than some of those people back then. What the hell were you thinking when you decided to wear that swimsuit to the game? Did you want to be the center of attention or something? You embarrassed us both. Stevie, I'm sorry, she whimpered. I think I just wanted to be noticed. You didn't mind when that redhead was there jumping up and down. Marin was wearing everything except her arms and legs. I barked. You looked like a hell dancer. I don't want to be that guy whose wife shows her breasts to everyone. If that's what you want, maybe you need someone else. Stevie, we need to talk about this later, she said. Sorry, I'll change if you want, but you have to go to the track. For what? I asked. I don't want to watch them run. If they run the same way they play basketball, it's not worth it. She muttered something under her breath that I barely heard. What did you say? I asked. She hugged me. I signed you up for the race, she said. What? I shouted, pushing her away. Why the hell did you do that? I already told you I won't participate in any of this crap. Darling, do you love me? She asked. Of course I do. I blurted out. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't be here. I never wanted to come to this meeting. Moreover, I did not want to participate in the entertainment. Ever since we came here, Dana, I've been wondering if you love me. You have been ignoring my wishes since the moment we arrived. I don't even understand why this is so important to you. We've been married for almost five years and the first thing we talked about and had in common was that we both hated high school in general and most of these people in particular. I don't understand, Stevie. Please do this one thing for me, she whimpered. When you love someone, you should support their dreams, even if you don't understand them. If you just run this one race, I swear I'll never ask you for anything again. You run marathons. Nobody is asking you to run 26 miles, it's just one damn mile. If you can run 26 miles just for fun, why can't you run one mile for me? Or is the reason you refuse because you really don't love me? Sure enough, less than 10 minutes later, I was on the track with 25 other guys and 4 women. Dana sat in the front row, joyfully clapping her hands and waving to me. I noticed that there were a lot of guys around her who weren't even looking at the start of the race, they were looking at her. So, gentlemen, the presenter began, you will run one mile. This is four laps around the track. You will be eligible for two different prizes. The first is a reward for first, second, or third place. Second, we will compare your time to the time you ran in high school on required physical tests. Whoever is closest to their school time will receive an award. What about awards for age categories? Asked the voice from the crowd. You're all from the same class, idiot. This means that you are all probably the same age, the presenter said. Then I noticed that M.O. was next to me. Hey Stevie, glad to see you're onto something, he said. Don't go out too quickly, try to start at a pace that you can maintain throughout the distance. The worst thing you can do is go out too quickly and then trudge while everyone else runs past you and laughs. Thanks for the advice, I said. While I was still talking to him, a shot rang out and we started to run. I expected a fast pace. Usually, in a marathon, a large group of guys goes out very quickly to get away from the crowd and then settles into their own pace. I think I expected this when the shot sounded. I thought we were going to be shot out of a cannon, but it was more like we just crawled out of the trunk. I timed the first lap, and we completed it in a minute and 45 seconds, it was a 7 minute mile. I almost fell asleep, I could maintain this pace for 10 miles easily. I moved right behind Mo, who was leading on the second lap. M.O. maintained the pace, and many runners began to fall behind. At the end of the second lap, we were running even slower, but the runners followed us. On the third lap, I realized that most of these guys never exercise. They huffed and puffed worse than M.O. M.O. was first, I was second, and two women were third and fourth. M.O. puffed like an old steam locomotive and began to look around. This is a bad sign in a marathon, this could either mean that you are trying to assess your position and make sure no one is catching up or that you are exhausted. I decided it was the latter, so at the end of the third lap, with one lap left, I just started running faster and passed MO almost casually. 
I waited to see if he would react, and I could tell by the look on his face that he couldn't, so I just turned up the speed. I won the race with a very mediocre time of 6 minutes and 50 seconds. I was the only one who ran a mile under 7 minutes. M.O. ran a 7.45 and finished 4th, two women overtook him. Since my best mile time in school was over 8 minutes, I also happened to be the person who did the best compared to the past. One of the women also beat her school time, but only by 20 seconds. Dana was completely delighted. Many people came up to congratulate me, and the underlying feeling of most was that their surprise that my winning the race was second only to their shock that someone, particularly me, had passed them all. This was unheard of. When I returned to the beach to rest for a while, a lot of people came up to me. Some wanted to talk about possible jobs at my company, others wanted to discuss the race or a football match I didn't intend to play. Dana continued to try to interfere in conversations, but no one paid attention to her. Finally, Marty came up and begged me to be an alternate on the football team. There were so many people watching and waiting for my answer that I couldn't say no. We were going to play flag football on the beach anyway. We walked up to the field, and I got my flags and stood on the sideline. At least I could help by pointing out open players. I noticed that Dana was frowning again. I couldn't understand why, I thought she would be pleased. The game was again a spectacle of sports mediation. Neither side could do anything. By the end of the first half, incredibly, the Never Never team had scored a touchdown. I was happy at first until I noticed Dana cheering in her swimsuit. I was sure that she understood my views on this. I glared at her, and she pretended not to notice me. The team scored a touchdown late in the second half to tie the game with just five minutes remaining. With less than a minute left, they got the ball, and it looked like they were going to score again. We need you, Marty said. We need you to cover one of their receivers. If you can stop him from catching the ball, maybe we can keep the tie. I was already angry with Dana, so I went to the game. How hard can it be to stop a guy from catching a ball? I stood opposite Gary, he was a running receiver instead of a running back, so I assumed M.O. was going to throw him the ball. When the ball was put in play, M.O. looked across the field at the other receiver, and so did everyone else. M.O. pulled his arm back, turned, and threw the ball, not to the guy everyone was looking at, but straight to Gary, like he always did. I jumped right in front of Gary and intercepted the ball. I raced toward the opposite end zone with Gary chasing me. I realized that M.O. was angry. He quickly walked toward me. He didn't try to grab my flags, he dove at me as if he was trying to knock me down. I think he was really angry about the interception. I pretended to go left, and he ducked just as I passed him to the right. M.O. fell to the ground, and I scored my first and only touchdown. I didn't do a dance after the touchdown or anything like that, I just stood there looking stupid and handed the ball to the ref. The announcer announced that time was up and that the Never Never team had won the game. The whole crowd was screaming. I got so many pats on the back, it was crazy. My teammates came over and lifted me onto their shoulders. This was the last good memory of that day. After my teammates put me on the ground, I went to look for Dana. Well, looks like you'll get what you want, she said sarcastically. No, apparently not, I snapped. My wish was for you to take off this swimsuit or at least keep it covered. What happened to I'll change if you want, she asked. What's wrong with my swimsuit, she continued. You love watching me in it. Why shouldn't other men like it? You are my wife, I retorted, and I don't like it when everyone looks at you like that. Steve, you are my husband, not my master, she snapped. I can do whatever I want. Not all of us get everything on a silver platter. Some of us need to work to get noticed and get our votes. If you don't like men looking at me in the swimsuit, then maybe you should just go back to the hotel because tonight is my last chance to get votes, and I need to work. I can't believe so many people are voting for your girlfriend, Dana. I never tried to tell you what to do, but don't walk around in that damn swimsuit, I said. What will happen if I do this, she asked. Forget it, Dana, I snapped. Do what you want. I left her and headed back to the hotel. Before I got there, Emo stopped me. Great job on the race, he said. I noticed that he didn't mention anything about the football match. There's something I'd like to talk to you about, he said. 
I work in sales and have been unemployed for some time. I heard about your company and wanted to see if you could give me a job. We're old school friends, and you kind of owe it to me. I looked at him as if he had just laid a brick on the sidewalk. I think not, Morris, I said and turned to leave. He got angry when I called him Morris. What the hell do you mean, I guess not, he shouted. Exactly what I said, I replied calmly. I have high standards for my company and my employees. I don't know what kind of salesman you are, but I know what kind of person you are. We outgrow some things, while others stay with us. In school, you were that person who loved to bully and torment those smaller than you. Some might consider it a joke or have done it a couple of times, but you made a career out of it. You spent most of your time coming up with ways to make life difficult for those who were mostly defenseless. I don't want someone like that working for me. He started screaming as I walked away. I ignored him and headed toward the parking lot and my car. I went to the hotel, and as soon as I arrived, I started packing my things. Before I could finish, I received a call from the service saying that several people were waiting for me. There were more than a couple of them, and they all wanted information about my company. I went to the reception and asked if the hotel had office space for businessmen. The woman behind the counter spoke with the manager, and I was able to rent one of their offices for a couple of hours. I called my office and asked for company information materials to be faxed and made copies for everyone present. We discussed what my company does and where we are going. About halfway through the discussion among the new arrivals, I noticed one red-haired woman who, every time our eyes met, looked away in shame. After we were done and everyone had enough information to their satisfaction, I was going back to my room to finish getting ready. Stevie, I'm here to apologize again for my stupid husband, she said. I heard what he told you, and you were absolutely right. I can't believe he started off by talking about old school friends and how much you owe him. This is why he is unemployed now, he's too arrogant for his own good. In any case, congratulations. Everything seems to be going according to plan for you. Many of us got stuck in a rut that we created during school and just couldn't get out of it. Thank you, I said and turned around. She grabbed me by the shoulder. Stevie, did I do something to you? She asked. I know that your wife doesn't love me for some reason, and I can't understand what I did wrong to her. There are so many people who blame me for things that other people have done. I tried to apologize to her several times, but she does not listen or accept my apology. What have I done to you too? Marin, you never did anything to me or to her, I said. Then why do you leave every time I try to talk to you, she asked. I could see that she was upset. Then she began to pour out her emotions. All my life, I tried to be nice to everyone I met. Why don't people ever give me a chance, she said. Marin, it's not about you, I said. They're just people. Well, I'm human too, she said. I have feelings too. My life is hell. Emo treats me like a slave, and everyone else treats me like an outcast. I came here to try to make friends among those who know me. Half of them treat me like some kind of princess, and the other half like the evil witch from Snow White. I can't understand what you think about me. Princess, I said. Definitely a princess. You don't behave like that. She said, offended, Marin, at school, I was, as you remember, the butt of all the jokes. I was the school scapegoat, but I had the biggest crush on you. To me, you were the most beautiful creature. I was too shy to even look at you, let alone talk to you. This is so stupid, she said. Stevie, I talk to anyone who talks to me. I'm just a woman, that's all. And that's part of the problem. Every guy I talked to kept asking me how I ended up married to such a jerk. Usually, I just shrugged, but I want you to know the real reason. There are two of them. Firstly, before the wedding, Morris never showed his bad side. He always behaved like a gentleman and treated me kindly. Then he gradually began to show his true colors. The second reason I ended up with him was that all these nice guys who supposedly loved me never had the courage to approach me. This left me with two choices, either I sat at home alone and didn't go anywhere because no one ever asked me out, or I went with the only guy who was brave enough to approach me. But you were the queen of the school, I said. How could anybody compare to this? No one needed to be compared to anything, she snapped. 
We all have dreams and desires. Do you know what my dream was? I shook my head. I wanted what my sisters had. I wanted a man who would love me, a house, and children. I don't need to go to fancy events or wear a lot of jewelry. I want a man who would look at me the way you look at your wife. Stevie, people always told me I was beautiful or something like that. I have three sisters, and I am the ugliest of us. We all look somewhat alike, I'm nothing special. The only thing that sets me apart is that all my sisters have found men who treat them like important people, while my husband can't hold down a job. When he gets one, he spends all his money trying to impress people. We have no savings and are barely staying afloat. We were named the couple most likely to succeed, and the only thing we succeeded in was school. I couldn't say anything. Why doesn't your wife love me? She asked. It's easy, I said. You are her dream woman. So, is there a chance I'll get a dance from you tonight? She asked. I'd really like to. I could tell M.O. that I'd talk to her about at least a formal interview. Not much chance, I'm afraid, I said. My wife won't allow it. Right, she asked. That's not the point, I said. I'm just leaving. I won't be here for the dance. I didn't want to come, it was Dana's idea. Stevie, you have to stay, she said. Besides, we might have a chance at this dance. Why do you think so? I asked. Because I'll spend the rest of the day campaigning for votes to win the queen. Almost everyone is already voting for you to be king, so we will have to dance at least once, she said. I thought the vote was pretty tight between you and Dana, I said. Oh, it was, she said. Both Anne and Trifaith heard it. It doesn't matter to me. We are the dog reprom queen tiara on his collar for yours. If you have both a pack and three to win. Besides, most women have started to hate your wife because of that swimsuit she wears all the time, and many guys are also beginning to turn away from her. Most of the people who still vote for her do so because of you. So can you please stay so I can have at least one good memory from this fiasco and maybe one good new friend? There was just no way I could tell her no. Only if I get more than one dance, I said. I had a lot of ideas in my head. On one hand, I needed to find out where he and M.O. lived. Maybe they could move. I didn't want to hire M.O., but maybe I could hire her. Heck, I'd hire M.O. if that meant I could see her regularly. I couldn't change my wife in any way. I loved her too much. But Marin was so beautiful, and the idea of becoming friends with the woman of my dreams was very appealing. And speaking of Dana, if she could run around looking like a fool in front of all our classmates, then I could dance with Marin. I took out my suit and laid it out on the bed. I decided to just order room service and watch TV until it was time to dance. I only had a few hours left before leaving. Before the food arrived, the door to the room opened, and Dana entered. There was something strange about her. Why are your suitcases packed? She asked. We are leaving. I know you're not leaving, I barked. But I was going to leave. In fact, if it weren't for a bunch of people looking for work who persuaded me to stay, I would have left already. That's why the suitcases are packed. But you didn't pack my things, she said. Were you planning to leave without me? Yes, I said, turning back to the TV. After the crap you gave me about how you're not my damn slave, I don't want to do anything with you. All I heard this afternoon was you running around dressed up and acting like A. You don't know what that means to me, she said. I guess I don't, I said, turning back to the TV. Why don't I take a shower and freshen up, and then I'll show you how much you mean to me, she suggested. No, thanks, I said. You'll really like this, she said. We both enjoyed it last night, and you wanted it again this morning. Listen, Dana, I'm trying to relax before I go to this damn dance and pretend I'm having fun with a bunch of people who don't matter to me, and a few who do. After this, I will leave. Maybe I won't even wait until morning to leave, I said. Oh, honey, that's so sweet, she said. I know you're going to the dance for me, and I know it's really bad. This is the first time we've ever fought, but we'll get through this. It's just a nightmare, and by this time tomorrow, we will be back to the way things have always been. Can we please go to a farewell breakfast, too? I want everyone to see me and remember me as the queen of the meat. 
think of it as part of dancing. If you can go to the dance for me, breakfast is much shorter. Do this one thing for me, Dana. I'm not going to the dance for you. I already told you I was planning to leave after you gave me all this crap about how you're not my damn slave. I don't want to do anything with you. I'm going because I promised my friend I'd be there. I didn't promise anything about breakfast. You have a credit card, you can come home whenever you want. I said she was acting very strange. She kept looking at me to see if I was looking at her. I was just watching my show, and when it was time, I went to the shower and got dressed. Stevie, are you forgetting something? She asked. What exactly? I replied, opening the door. I'm not ready yet, she said. Then take the shuttle, I suggested, or let the person who brought you here take you. I closed the door before I heard her answer. Even when I parked my Mustang, people were waving at me. Hey, Stevie, people said one after another. You look great, several women remarked. Great catch. I heard from several guys. When I walked in, I noticed Emo and his friends were already standing in the corner talking. They saw me, and Emo looked at me angrily, then they all started laughing. If he was planning one of his little pranks, he'd be in trouble because this wasn't high school. I was in the mood to kick his fifth place if he stepped out of line. I met Marty, and we hung out for a while. Emo saw me and came over to Marty and me. Stevie, I shouldn't have said some of those things, he said, holding out his hand. No offense. No offense, I replied. I think you're partly right about some things he said. Maybe we can talk about this later, but I need a favor. I hurt my knee when I fell trying to catch you in a game. It was already sore from the race, so I couldn't make it through the last lap. Can you dance with Marion a few times? Of course, I said. He seemed to smile as he walked away. Why the hell is he smiling? Marty asked. Does he really think that anyone will believe he didn't catch up with you because of his bad knee? No, he's smiling because he thinks he convinced me to dance with Marion so she could talk to me about hiring him, I said. I don't want to work with that. Don't worry about it, Marty said. Are you really going to refuse her? He asked again. Damn. If this woman asked me to put it in a bucket and then smear it all over my face, I probably would have done it. Most likely. What did Dana ask, appearing from behind? I turned to her. She wore a neon blue dress with cutouts on the sides. It was obvious that she was not wearing a bra or panties. Marty's eyes widened. Dana took my hand, and I skillfully walked away from her. Darling, do we have to fight here too? She asked quietly. This will all end soon. I think it's finished now, Dana, I said. I'm trying not to make a scene, but I don't want to be around you when you're dressed like that. It makes people think I agree with it. I had already gone through high school as an object of ridicule. I don't want to spend this evening with people laughing at me, too. I walked away from her. One day, she convinced Marty to dance with her. As I crossed the hall, I noticed that everyone was looking at her. I just shook my head. When this is over, Dana and I will have a long discussion about whether we should stay together. Suddenly, I noticed that no one was looking at Dana anymore, everyone was looking the other way. I turned to see what was going on and saw Marion come in. Her naturally curly hair was straightened and styled in cascading curls that fell to her waist. Her beautiful face was half hidden behind a curtain of hair, which only made her more enticing. The single visible eye was playful and intriguing. Her dress was completely different from Dana's, it was tied above the waist and emphasized her slender figure and small but perfect breasts instead of bulging out like fruit on a tray for everyone to see. Only the tops of Marion's breasts were visible, but her neck and shoulders were exposed, drawing attention to the smoothness of her skin and making me want to see more. Below the waist, the dress flared out like Civil War dresses. I was surprised how many hoops there were under it. When Marion looked back and found Emo, she seemed to move with such grace that it felt like she was floating. Emo barely noticed her. She stood next to him, said a few words, then looked around the crowd until she found me. He pointed at me, and she nodded, pretending that she didn't want to come to me but had to. The closer she got, the less she could hide her smile. But she wasn't the only one whose expression changed. Dana saw Marion walking toward me and left Marty standing on the dance floor. 
Several people tried to talk to her, but she ignored them, hurrying to get between Marion and me. At the same time, I headed toward Marion. Would you like to dance, Stephen? She asked. The hell with it. Dana barked. He only dances with his woman. Dana, shut up, I said. You're embarrassing yourself and losing more of your precious votes. She looked around and saw the expressions on the faces of the people around us. One damn dance and that's it, she hissed. Dana, if you can run around all day acting like a fool, I can dance with whoever I want for as long as I want. We didn't come to this dance together, and if you continue to behave like this, we won't leave together either, I said, ending the conversation. After the dance, I walked her back to M.O. and his friends and went to sit at the table with Marty. Dana took a drink and walked over to us. I hope you don't mind if I sit here, she said. Before I could respond, the host reminded everyone to vote for the king and queen, as the ceremony would begin in five minutes. Best athlete nominees, please come up on stage, he asked. M.O. quickly stood up and walked toward the stage, along with a couple of other guys. Welcome to Mo's show, I said jokingly. Steve and Grant, we are waiting for you. Do you need a personal invitation? Asked the presenter. I was surprised he introduced each one and talked about what they had done in school sports. This is strange, he said when he reached me. This guy didn't do anything at school. A juggler, some drunk guy shouted. Everyone started laughing. I even laughed because this time they weren't laughing at me, they laughed with me, and it was funny. Then someone said something that changed the situation. Damn, I'd take up juggling if it would make Marin dance with me, said another guy. I was still laughing, and so was Marin, but M.O. began to look very annoyed, and Dana crossed her arms, looking around to see who said it. In fifth place, we have Todd Bridges, the announcer said. Todd competed in every sport today. He finished last in the race and didn't score in basketball or football, but he had the courage to go out on the field. Todd received faint applause. In fourth place, honorable mention is Tina Struthers. She placed second in the mile race and was the first female overall. She was also second in achievements compared to what she did in school. She actually beat her school time. Tina received loud applause. In third place is Gary Coleman, the host said. He continued to list Gary's accomplishments for the day. Damn, I thought it was supposed to be you, M.O. whispered. Well, second place isn't bad either, he said, patting me on the back. Sorry, I screwed up, the host said. Third place was actually Morris Green. I was very wrong, sorry. But that's good news, Gary. You actually moved up to second place. Third place? M.O. shouted. I didn't place third. That's crap. I've never placed that low. Let me see the results. He tried to snatch the results sheet from the presenter. You didn't score any points in basketball, the announcer began. You were fourth in the race, he was fifth. I'd say you guys are evenly matched. He's closer to his high school days than you are. That put him ahead. The last one is a football game. He ran the ball for a touchdown, you didn't throw the ball to him. It was a pass that put him even further ahead. He beat you fair and square. Emo looked around and saw many angry faces in the crowd. Um, I was just kidding, he said nervously. Nobody believed it, everyone could see that he was angry about third place anyway, said the host. Stephen Grant comes in first. The crowd exploded and started screaming. I was shocked. I didn't want to participate in the race and had to be dragged to the football field. I looked at the crowd, everyone was waiting for me to say something. I walked up to the microphone. Um, thanks, I started. I don't know how it happened. I'm not a great athlete like these guys. I didn't want to run the race, but my wife made me. In school, the only thing I did was run away from these guys to avoid stretching my underwear over your head. The crowd burst into laughter. I think it just goes to show that anything can happen. School wasn't a great time for me. I didn't really want to come to this reunion. The only reason I'm here is because I love my wife, and she really wanted to come. But for many reasons, including some people I either met again or met for the first time, I'm glad I came. 
Some of you will be remembered in my memory, not as people who ignored or persecuted me, but as the people who work in my company. Even more of you will remain in my memory as my friends. It's nice to see that we can leave the petty jealousies and rivalries of the past behind and move on because we have more in common than we have differences. There was thunderous applause, and then some drunk guy in the back shouted, Enough of this crap. Let's watch the juggling. The presenter came back to the microphone. Okay, friends, all the votes have been counted. They're being processed right now, so grab another drink or dance again, and we'll be back with you soon. As he walked away from the microphone, the music started playing again, and several couples began to dance. M.O. jumped off the stage and headed toward the bar. Someone shouted to him as he walked by, Hey M.O., does it hurt your bad knee to jump off the stage? M.O. gave him the finger and headed towards the bar, where he began drinking with both hands. I stood with Marty, who congratulated me while I looked for Dana, but she was nowhere to be seen. Oh damn, Marty said. I turned to see what he was looking at. Marin was walking towards us. Can I have this trophy? Marty asked. I mean, it really should be mine. I was the one who got you on the football field. Marin laughed when she heard his words. She stood next to Marty, and he visibly tensed. He stopped joking and stood at attention. Marty, I'm not here to stop your fun, Marin said. I wish you wouldn't get so serious all the time. It really makes me feel bad. But you, Marty began. I have an idea, she said. Let's start over again. She held out one small hand in front of him. Hi, I'm Marin, she said. Ah, Marty, he muttered. Okay, now we know each other and can be friends, she said. Marty, right now I'd like to dance with your friend Stevie. Is that okay? Marty nodded his head woodenly. Marty, she said. He turned to her like a soldier called by a general. Why, why yes, ma'am, he said. Can you save the dance for me later too, she asked. Do you want to dance with me, he asked. She simply nodded. As we hit the dance floor, I heard Marty mutter behind me, Damn, I can't dance. I pulled Marin much closer to me than the first time. She smiled and laid her head on my shoulder, her little sigh let me know that she was pleased. Unfortunately, before we started dancing, the music stopped and the host began reading out the names again. The contestants for the title of Gathering Queen are Natalie Green, Blair Warner, Tootie Ramsey, Josephine Joe Pick, Dana Plato Grant, and finally, Marin Jones Green. The crowd applauded loudly. Marin, you should probably be with M.O. right now, I said. You're probably right, she said. It doesn't seem to be about where I want to be, it's more about where I should be. See you later. Good luck. Good luck with what? I asked. You are among the contenders for the king, fool. Remember, she smiled. I laughed. Such things don't matter, I said. I might have to get a dog so he can wear a crown on his collar. She smiled at this, and her smile sent shivers down my spine. Don't worry about it, I said. I won't win, I'm not that person, but I'll be rooting for you. I really wish we had spent time together at school, she said. I feel like I wasted my life. The lights grew brighter as the presenter returned to the stage. I watched as Marin walked up to M.O. and tried to hug him, but he pushed her away and picked up his drink. Marin looked at me and shook her head. Okay, Winterhalter School Class of 02, let's get started, the presenter exclaimed. To speed up the process, we will only challenge the three with the most votes. To everyone else, thank you for participating, and remember that you are all queens in my eyes. Okay, I'm going, Dana said. I hadn't noticed that she was standing next to me. Where the hell have you been, Dana? I asked. I should have made sure I got the votes, she snapped. Obviously, you were only interested in your sports award. Dana, did you notice what I said during my speech after I received it? I asked. She looked at me and shook her head. Why don't you ask someone? I said, leaving her behind. Can we invite Tootie Ramsey on stage? shouted the presenter. And can we invite Blair Warner? We need another girl to join them, call Marin Jones. What? Dana screamed. This is crap. I should have one. 
I looked at Dana and shrugged. Honey, let's get out of here. She screamed, they're all liars and cheaters. You were right, it was a mistake to come here. Out of 214 votes, Blair Warner received 42 votes, the announcer shouted. She took third place. Tootie Ramsey received 50 votes. Surprisingly, none of the other contestants received more than two votes, with the exception of our overall winner, who received over 100 votes. Your 10th anniversary queen is Marin Jones. The crowd erupted as Marin stepped forward. She had the tiara placed on her head and waved to the crowd. She walked up to the microphone and thanked everyone, repeating the host's words that all the women who participated were queens and that they were all special in their own way. This is getting deeper and deeper, Dana said next to me. I'm sure you're happy your dreamy girl stole another crown. We'll never come to events like this again. To hell with all these people. We don't need them, right? I didn't pay attention to her now. The beautiful Marin will help us by reading out the names of the contenders for the title of King of the Meeting, said the host. Nominees for the title of King of the Meeting, Marin began in her musical voice. This is Conrad Bain, Gary Coleman, Todd Bridges, my husband, Morris Jones, and Stephen Grant. The way she said my name made many people think there was more to it than just the order of the names. I smiled at her, and she smiled back. Why is that ugly brat smiling at you? Dana asked. We still haven't discussed where you've been, I said. We need to invite only the three with the most votes on stage, said the host. I think he was trying to tone it down because we were all tired of his over-the-top delivery. The fair Marin will read the names, he said. The three best are. Marin began, Gary Coleman, Todd Bridges, and she hesitated and looked at him. Oh, sorry, buddy, Marty said next to me. I told you it was crap, Dana said. Stevie Grant, sang Marin enthusiastically. M.O. threw his drink, smashing the glass on the floor. What the hell is going on, he shouted. I am the king. Always have been and always will be. You all probably spelled the names wrong. There was dead silence as the crowd watched his hysteria. Maybe you should take up juggling, said a voice from the back. M.O. looked around furiously as Todd, Gary, and I walked up onto the stage. Every guy in this competition is a king, said the host, even if only for his wife and family. For some reason, more people voted for the king than for the queen. We had 222 votes for the king. The three guys on stage are here because they got the most votes. Let's say the gentleman in fourth place, who is not on the stage, missed this place by only one vote. Morris Green received three votes. I only got three votes. M.O. shouted. How is this possible? I voted for you, M.O. said. Me too, Todd Bridges said. Did you vote for yourself? Of course, cried M.O. Can we continue? asked the presenter. In third place, with four votes, Todd Bridges. Todd walked to the front of the stage and then walked down the steps. His wife took his hand, and they stood awaiting the ceremonial dance of the top three couples. In second place, with six votes, Gary Coleman shouted the host. Gary copied Todd's actions and walked down the steps to the other side of the stage. His wife obviously wasn't very smart. She walked to the same side of the dance floor where Todd and his wife were standing. She looked back, saw Gary, and ran towards him, tripping over the hem of her dress and falling on her face. Her dress was relatively short, and it rode up to reveal her cellulite-covered rear in a leopard print thong. She stood and bowed to the crowd, who burst into laughter. And your 10-year anniversary king, said the host, with a total of 207 votes, is Stephen Grant. Everyone applauded as I headed to one side of the stage. Dana ran towards me with a big smile on her face. According to tradition, the king must dance a ceremonial dance with the queen, said the host. Dana looked embarrassed and retreated into the crowd. Marin walked down the steps on the opposite side of the stage, and we met in the middle. Told you so, she said, playfully grabbing my hand. We danced, and they turned off the lights, leaving only a large disco ball shining above the crowd. It felt like flying as we spun around the dance floor, it was all over too quickly. The lights returned, and the host concluded the program by encouraging everyone to eat, drink, and be merry. 
Can we see the juggling now? Shouted a voice from the back row. The DJ started playing dance music. I really didn't want to let Marin go. The voice assistant announced that I had an incoming call from Dana. I just yelled, ignore, and my music continued playing. After a while, I shouted ignore, so often that the word became like the chorus to the song I was listening to. What do you want, Dana? I asked, feeling exasperated. I want you to come back here and talk to me about this, she said, crying. And that redhead and her husband want to talk to you too. I don't care if you talk to them. This is about us, honey. I made mistakes, you were right. We should never have come here. I was desperate, I wanted to win so badly, but she just kept cheating. I hung up and continued driving. After an hour or so, I ran out of gas. I decided the smartest thing to do was go back to the hotel. I'd rent another room and take all my things. I really needed to find out what happened to Marin, but after that, I was leaving here. I returned to the hotel parking lot a little after midnight. I got out of the car, thinking that I would be relatively safe from collisions. I did not stay at the hotel where the meeting took place, I was a mile away at the hotel where Dana and I were staying. I was sure Marin and Mo didn't know where we were staying, and Dana would be waiting for me in the ballroom. But, like everything else that has happened since I came here, I was wrong on both fronts. Not only were Marin and Mo in the lobby, but Dana was there too. They weren't together. Marin and Mo looked at each other and talked quietly at the table next to the elevators, and Dana stood right at the door. Dana looked at me when I entered and walked towards me. Mo and Marin did the same. Stevie. Dana began. I raised my hand, and she fell silent. Hey, Stevie, can we talk? M.O. asked. I know you and your woman have a lot to talk about, but we need to talk first. You'll have plenty of time to talk to the woman, but our business can't wait. Morris, we have nothing to talk about. As always, you hurt me. You took away what meant the most to me in life and ruined it. Just like at school. Now go celebrate. The only thing that's different from school is that I now have a choice. I don't have to stay here. So tomorrow at breakfast, when you tell everyone how you ruined my marriage, I won't be there. So you'll be telling this to a bunch of people I'll never see again and don't care about, I said. In the end, we both won and we both lost. Let's just call it a draw and go our separate ways. I embarrassed you a little at the sporting event and took your crown. In a way, I won. You were a little embarrassed because you couldn't show up like you did in school, but you won because, despite all my achievements at this meeting, you took away what meant the most to me. You will still leave with the most beautiful girl we know. What, M.O.? You won, but at the same time, you have lost. Marin has already convinced me to consider hiring you, but now there is not the slightest chance that you or any of your friends will ever work for me. In some way, you helped me. You helped me see several things in the woman I marry that I could never accept. You wanted her, you got her. Now she's yours, Emmo treat her well. I always tried, I said, turning to leave. He grabbed my arm but immediately let go when he saw the expression on my face. That's not true, Steve. I was drunk. I'm not used to losing. We need to talk and we can work this out, but don't blame the woman. They all want some, M.O. It's not her fault that my animal magnetic attraction got the best of her. But I'm telling you, I can fix this. We can work this out if you give me a minute or two. Stevie, he's full of crap, Dana said. I love you. I always have. I screwed up, and I know it. After you left, people came up to me and said you were only here for me. I realized then how stupid I was. I tried to please and impress a bunch of people who never cared about me and never will instead of the person who loves me. I know I have a lot of work and time ahead of me to fix this, but I'm sure we. Steve, we need to talk about this like men, Emmo said. Let's send the women to their knitting. There's no point in us arguing over a woman. There's enough for everyone, and this isn't that special. She's already slept with almost half of our classmates this weekend. Like you said. I did you a favor by showing you what she really is like. M.O., I'm not going anywhere with you to talk alone, I said. You have nothing that would interest me. Yes, there is, 
he grinned. What if I offered to settle this matter fairly? What do you mean? I asked. I'm a straightforward guy, he said. Can't vouch for Donnie or the other guys, but I had your wife, so you can have mine. I was shocked. Marin looked at the floor but didn't say anything. I'll offer you something even better, he continued. I spent an hour with your woman this afternoon. You can have Marin all day. Bring her back here in 24 hours, and we'll be even. I don't know if it was the expression on my face, but suddenly Dana screamed in horror. I turned and looked at her, but Imo saved me from having to deal with her. Shut up, stupid, he snapped. It's best for both of us. I screwed up, you screwed up too. We both heard him this way. He'll get something in return to ease his pain. If we don't make him happy, he won't forgive either of us. The pain on Dana's face was obvious. Emmo spoke again, and I wondered if he would ever shut up. You know you like this idea, he said. I've never met a guy who didn't want her. Even your little wife said that. He looked at Dana. What did you say? Who was she to him? His dream. I saw that Marin was starting to cry again. She stuck out her lower lip and didn't make a sound. Tears flowed down her cheeks. She extended her hand and reached for me. Let's go, she said. You have 24 hours, and not a second more, Dana said angrily. Dana's anger and the smug look on Mo's face are all I remember before I lost my temper. I turned around and, as hard as I could muster, punched Mo right in the nose. He fell back out of his chair and lay on the floor. After a few seconds, he sat up and looked at me. To hell with you, Morris, I said. You can't bribe me. I'm not a child. You're the luckiest man on the planet, and you're too stupid to realize it. Yes, I'm a fool. I'm just like you said, I'm just one of those idiots who will do anything for Marin. And yes, she is my dream. She has been since she was in school. But she's too special. I just hope it's too special to be sold like some kind of toy. One day she will realize that she is worth much more than you could give her, and she will simply leave you. I turned to leave. I didn't even bother to go up to my room and get my things. I called the hotel and asked them to send me my clothes. Stevie, we still need to talk about us, Dana said after me. How can I make it up to you? I turned to her. Dana, I'm leaving, I said. Just like this, right now. I need to get out of here. I shouldn't have come at all. I loved you and would do anything for you. Your credit card will be valid for a couple more days. Go home and get your things or go to your mom. I don't care which. But Steve, we can't solve this problem unless we work together, she said. We don't do that at all, I said. You cheated on me repeatedly. For what? To be the queen of people we don't even know or love? I can't forget or forgive this. I'll be nicer to you than you deserve if you just sign the papers when they come. But I really don't need to give you anything. We have a zero tolerance clause, remember? Stevie, don't be stupid, she said. This clause only applies if we get divorced, and even then, it's only if one of us is having an affair or being unfaithful. I don't want a divorce. I love you. It was just a mistake. I was just desperate for votes. I've never loved anyone but you. We just need to talk about it. No more words were needed. I walked out the door, got into my Mustang, and drove toward my future. I turned off my phone and went home. With lighter traffic on the roads, I was able to get home even faster. Just like in business, I focused on solving my problem. By the time I arrived home, I had mapped out all the necessary steps to fix it. I was home long before sunrise. I immediately took a shower and lay down in what I used to call our bed. I slept as much as I could and woke up before noon. I started collecting all of Dana's clothes and putting them in boxes in the garage. I packed all her personal belongings and even some of the photos she liked the most. Later in the evening, I answered the call and spoke to her. Stephen, can I come home? She asked. I'm going to buy a plane ticket from here. I cried myself to sleep last night. You and her husband had a big fight and he punched her in the face. He's in jail, and she went home without him. 
I thought about what I had done all day. I knew I was wrong, but I was out of my mind. Could you forgive me? I forgive you, Dana, I said. I'll be home in two hours. Dana, I continued, I said I would forgive you. It's not that I want to stay married to you or that I'll ever forget about it. I've already collected your clothes and put them in the garage. You'll leave your car, too. If we just leave this behind and move on, I think you should go to your mom's or your dad's apartment and come here tomorrow while I'm at work to pick up your things. But Steve, we could. Goodbye, Dana, I said as I hung up. I went to a nice restaurant and got takeout. I took the food and drove to the nearest lake to think about what to do. When I got home that evening, the phone rang. I answered, it was Dana's father. We talked for a while and he told me that his daughter was desperate and had been crying since she got to her mom's house. He begged me to seek counseling to see if there was any way to save our once very happy marriage. I didn't want to remind him of this, but it was his cheating on his wife that made Dana so worried that I would ever cheat on her. She was the one who chose the zero tolerance clause in the prenup when we got married. It was meant to protect her, but it worked for me too. I told him that I intended to leave Dana some money and all her things, she would have more than enough to start over. But if she irritated herself, she would end up with nothing. Finally, I asked him if she told him why we were breaking up. He said she told him that she got a little drunk at a party and did something she shouldn't have. I spent the next half hour detailing the truth about her behavior. I told him everything, from the clothes she wore to how she slept with half the guys in her class. The embarrassment alone was too much for me. She was his daughter, so I knew he wanted to make her happy, but by the end of the call, I was confident that he understood my point of view. The next day, I filed for divorce. Several days passed before Dana came to get her things. She also came in the evening when she knew I would be there. I hadn't changed the locks yet, so she just walked into the house. She saw me in the kitchen and began to undress. Dana, what the hell are you doing? I asked. From now on, until you truly forgive me, I will not be your wife, she said. I'll just be your night slave. I'll be the best intim you've ever had. Don't you want another chance with these breasts and that fifth place you paid for? Dana, I never cared, I told her. We bought those things to make you feel better. I fell in love with you before you even got any of this. We got married before you got it, too. Steve, you even gave up that redhead for me. I know you want me, she said. Dana, you're kind of perverted, I said. Almost everything that happened to us happened because of your jealousy, and Dana, that was stupid. It wasn't stupid, she snapped. You've been obsessed with that your whole damn life. I'm prettier than her, my breasts are bigger, I have the best body. I'm better than her and no one sees it. Dana, in your mind, it was just a competition between the two of you. I never wanted to go to the reunion. I followed you. If you hadn't insisted, I would never have seen her again. I only loved you. Fool, you destroyed everything we had. Marin had nothing of what you threw away. She didn't have a husband who loved her, she stuck with him oh. We had everything, Dana, but that wasn't enough for you. Now get dressed and leave. From that day on, I tried to focus only on work. As I was trying to expand the company, I hired four of my former classmates, including Marty. Three of them needed to move to our area, and the company assisted them with this and helped them fit into our community. The divorce went through the courts, and throughout our lives, Dana fought this tooth and nail. Over time, we became increasingly hostile. She tried to get me to go to counseling, but I refused and was almost charged with contempt of court. My lawyer quickly decided to dissuade her from counseling by threatening to maintain the original language of the prenuptial agreement that she insisted on. This would have meant that instead of the fairly generous compensation I offered, Dana would have walked away with nothing. Finally, she decided to try a different tactic, she just gave in and signed the papers. She claimed that the hostility I began to show towards her hurt her. She decided it was better to leave her friends and try to start over rather than have me end up hating her. Months after signing the divorce papers, she called me and tried to get me to meet her or go on a date with her. I had dinner with her a couple of times before I had to pass. She misinterpreted my attempt to remain friends with her as starting our relationship over again. 
She even asked me how many dates it would take before we could have a night. I had to explain to her that part of our relationship was over and that although we might be friends, we would never be together again. She didn't take it very well. At first, I think she spent several weeks stalking me. Finally, over the phone, since I didn't want to see her in person, she asked me what I wanted. Steve, at first I thought you didn't want me back because you'd already found someone, she said. I hate to admit it, but I've been following you everywhere and you're not dating anyone. Not a damn thing, I said. Been there, done that. I'm not going out with anyone, Dana. I was in love once and she hurt me very badly. I'm so sorry, Steve, she said. That was the last I heard from her for a while. I think she just needed to exhaust all possibilities of us getting back together before she moved on. About a year after our divorce, I finally went to visit her in the hospital. One of her implants irritated her pectoral muscles to the point that it had to be removed. They took out both implants and left her flat as a board. From what I've heard, she doesn't adapt well to change. I didn't go to any meetings until two years after the divorce. As I said earlier, the school holds an annual general meeting of all alumni, as well as meetings on the occasion of each year. I think these reunions bring in a lot of money. Anyway, I hadn't dated anyone in over a year, and it had been two years since my first meeting and my divorce when Marty and his new wife burst into my office and threw a ticket on my desk. Steve, you need to take the weekend off, he said. You're a nice guy but you're so stressed and upset that you're becoming. Marty was a very close friend and one of the few people who could tell me this. I smiled at his wife, Joanna. She was a stocky woman with glasses, but she was madly in love with Marty. Does everyone think so, Marty? I asked, or is it just you and Joanna? Does it matter, he asked. Well, if only you two, I grinned. I could just fire you two and move on, but I can't fire everyone. He picked up the ticket. You're coming, he said. It's a day off. You won't make miss time at work. Where am I going? I asked. Is this a baseball game? I looked at the ticket. Oh great, I said. There is no way I will go to one of these events again. Remember what happened the last time I let someone talk me into going to one of them? Yes, he said, smiling. You hired a lot of great people and doubled your annual profits. I thought about it for a long time and decided that it wouldn't hurt me to take a break from work for at least one weekend. There was also a possibility that I could hire a couple more people. I didn't make it to the icebreaker on Friday or the sports meet this morning, which wasn't a big loss because they were back to sack races and picnic type games. This way, they could get more people to participate rather than just watch. I didn't even bother to buy a new suit, I just put on one that I already had. I entered the ballroom and looked around. I saw several people I knew and waved to them. I found a table on the edge and sat down. Marty appeared out of nowhere, and Joanna was by his side as usual. What took you so long to get here? He asked. What happened to you last night and this morning? Well, Mom, I decided there was no hurry, I said. Come on, we're sitting here, Joanna said excitedly. We sat down at a table that was in the middle of the room. From where we were sitting, I really didn't understand what difference it made where we sat. Marty and Joanna got up to go dance, and someone tapped me on the shoulder. You are sitting in my place, she said. Now you'll have to dance with me. I don't dance, I said. I haven't danced in a couple of years. Marin came and sat opposite me. You could have danced with me here last year, she said. There was no reason for M.O. to let you dance with me last year. I told her he had nothing to lose, and I had nothing to lose. By this time last year, my divorce was final. In other words, we wasted an entire year, she said. What do you mean? I asked. Stevie, the last time I saw you was also the last time I spoke to Morris. You may not know this, but I listened to everything you said. I heard every word you said about how he used me and how special I was. This made me realize that no matter what he said to my face, Morris did not love me. He couldn't love me if he cheated on me, and this wasn't the first time your wife did this. There was also the fact that he was willing to persuade me to have an intim with another man to get what he wanted, so I filed for divorce from him the next day. Well done, I said. I came to homecoming last year looking for you, she said. 
I've been thinking about one thing constantly for the last two years. What is it? I asked. It doesn't matter if you're a liar like Emo, she said. You told me I was special. You have told many people that I am the woman of your dreams. I need to know if this is true. That's true, I said quietly. I kind of need proof, she said. How can I prove this? I asked. Well, it will take you 50 years or so, she said, placing her hand in mine. We can start by dancing. So I'm back to the question I asked when I started this story. Did I take her hand and give her the dance, along with the possibility of the future I had always dreamed of, or did I take the safe route and continue to wallow in self-pity and regret? Really, what do you think? Marin and I now have a whole house full of little red-haired girls who will someday drive another generation of boys crazy. I hope our children are smart enough to look beyond the people they love and find someone who truly loves them as much as I love their mom. But it will be their choice. All I know is that I'm happy with mine, although the road that brought us here was not the most direct. We are both very happy with our final destination. What do you think of our story today? It seems to me that when a wife feels insecure in her marriage, she does some mind-boggling things. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.